Good morning. Can y'all hear me? Good. Welcome to Excitement Sunday. Um, just to let y'all know what's been happening in church lately, and I mean very lately, like since last night. Um, we had planned for baptisms today, four people getting baptized, and uh, I don't think I'd been this excited and expectant for a long time. Then we came in this morning and uh, saw that the entire baptistry was empty and there was water all over the front of the floor. So uh, we quickly shifted into we can do this mode, and uh, people brought fans, we are wet dry vacuuming, not during the services, really loud. Uh, but anyway, and we are, uh, we are going to do our baptisms hopefully on July 10th. So we will let everybody know again. And uh, my apologies and thanks to those who were going to get baptized today and said, no, oh, no problem, Pastor Bill. You're still our favorite pastor. Actually, none of them said that. But anyway, there you go. Um, I wanted to relay a quick story you know, Jamie and I were church planters for a long time in, in Miami, Florida. And uh, when you're church planting, you start with just a handful of people. I think we had six the first day that we were there. And we started with six people, and we met in a school, what they called a cafetorium. It was a cafeteria, but they also used it as an auditorium. We rented it every Sunday. We set up on Friday nights, and uh, we tore down on Sunday after church. And... Uh, you know, in, in Miami, things get kind of warm pretty much all the time, but in summer it gets really warm. And uh, one Sunday we came in, and uh, of course we were getting there early to kind of set up everything, and uh, it felt sweltering in that cafetorium. And we talked to the custodian who was with us each Sunday, and he said, oh, we're so sorry, but the air conditioner isn't working. And you know, for a pastor, one of the worst things that can happen is if the air conditioner is not working because people are like already in a bad mood and then you get up to preach and they're like, can I sneak out before he sees me? Um, so it was, it was a sad day. And, uh, you know, we just did everything normal. We did worship. I tried to preach a little shorter, but anyway. Afterwards, no, was it afterwards or the next week? The next week, somebody came up to me and said, I was here last week. And I started apologizing right away. Oh, I'm so sorry. The AC usually works. Da, 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 da. And uh, he said, no, um, that's the reason why I came back this week. I was amazed at how the people in this church responded to such a crisis. And I went, well, okay, God, bring on crisis after crisis. We'll take that any day. No, no, no. So, I don't know this woman. Okay. <laughs> but uh, don't give her a microphone. All right, so... The other thing I want to share is um, I was listening to a preacher one time talking about character and what's inside of us, and he said, you know, if you ever want to know what's inside a cup, just jostle it a little bit and see what falls out. That's what's in the cup. And so we are here today to just thank God for being God. Jesus really did die on the cross, whether our baptistry held all the water or not. Um, we have no idea how the water came out. We have some clues, but we don't really care because we're going to do all this again on the 10th and uh, maybe come in at 3 in the morning just to check things, but I think it's going to be okay. Um, I think it's possible that God said, hey, you want to baptize four people? I want to baptize the whole church. <laughs> all right. Anyway, uh, let's open in prayer. Heavenly Father, we are thankful for you. Lord, when... Uh, things don't go as planned, we still believe that we are in the palm of your hand. So, Father, thank you. We're here to worship you. I pray that everything we say, think, and do would be glorifying to you. Receive our worship as it is due your name. Amen. Came 
in the goodness of God. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I'm surrendered now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I'm surrendered now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. And all my life you have been faithful. All my you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. I will sing of the goodness of God.
He is jealous for me. He is jealous for me. Love's like a hurricane. I am a tree bending beneath the weight of his wind and mercy. When all of a sudden I am unaware of these afflictions, eclipsed by glory and I realize just how beautiful you are and how great your affections are for me
You have been so, so kind to me. shadow you won't light up mountain you won't climb up coming after me there's no wall you won't kick down lie you won't tear down coming after me there's no shadow you won't light up mountain you won't climb up coming after me there's no wall you won't kick down lie you won't tear down coming after me Father, your love never changes. 
and we are so thankful. Father, we lift up Central New York to you. We pray that the churches of Central New York that bow their knee to you would shine like lights on a hill, that those who don't yet know you would be drawn to the light and ultimately drawn to Jesus. Father, we lift up uh, Ukraine. We lift up those in our fellowship who are sick or in the hospital. We lift up all those in need and pray that your Holy Spirit would flow through all of that. Well, sometimes we don't even know how to pray. The problem seems so daunting. We just ask that you not give up on us. Don't give up on America. Don't give up on your church. But let your Holy Spirit have his way. Lord, use everything that's happening to glorify you. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. You know, I read a gopher story about playing chess, and someone said, hey, we watched that online, and we're not so sure about your sermon, but we really like that story about the chess. I said, okay, well, let's do more of that then. Once upon a time, there was a town called? And in Gopherville, there's a gopher named? Well, Gilly Galley's father loved to play chess. In fact, he was the chess champion of Gopherville. He taught Gilly Galley and Silly Sally how to play too. They all played together often, and the kids got better and better, but they had never won a game against their father. Then one day, it was a warm, sunny day, summer day, and it was sprinkling rain outside. They decided to play a game of chess, but this time they planned to play some tricks on father to give them a better chance of winning. Gilly Galley and Silly Sally worked together on one side, and father was by himself on the other side, and secretly mother was on the kid's side too. The game started, and father looked like he was off to a good start. Then mother asked father to help, him open, help her open a jar with a lid that was stuck, and that distracted him a little bit. Then Silly Sally asked him how the horses moved, and Father said, They're not horses, they're called knights. Father had told her that many times. Then Gilly Galley asked Mother for a bowl of soup, and he slurped the soup. By the way, you should not slurp your soup. All that slurping distracted Father even more, and then he made a bad move. The kids jumped on it and took his castle. Father got a sour look on his face, like he had just eaten a whole lemon. Then Silly Sally asked Mother for some crackers to eat, and she ate them while leaning over the chessboard. Pretty soon she was getting more cracker crumbs on the board than she was getting in her mouth. Father found it hard to look for a good move because he was staring at the crumbs. Then he tried to move the crumbs off the board with his hand and accidentally knocked over a few pieces. Then he mumbled something about pigs and made another bad move. The kids quickly took his bishop and Father grunted. Silly Sally thought that Father's grunt made him sound like a little bit of a pig himself. <laughs> then Mother asked him if he wanted a sandwich. Not right now, dear, thank you. How about some soup, she asked. I don't think so, he said without even looking up. I bet you want a big piece of chocolate cake. And Mother put the cake right in front of him. As he reached for his queen to make a move, his hand scraped the icing on the cake, and he ended up with chocolate icing on his king. This bothered him a lot, and he tried to wipe the icing off the king, but then he forgot where he was going to move his queen, and he moved it to a square that his queen couldn't even go to. I don't think you, could, you can move there, said Gilly Galley with a smirky smile. Oh, where was my queen, asked Father. Silly Sally pointed to where the queen was before Father's illegal move, and she left several cracker crumbs on the square. Oh, dear, said Father, and he moved the queen to a very bad square. Gilly Galley took Father's queen like a dog might steal food off the kitchen table. Oh dear, Father said again. Mother looked at the board and chuckled. Now Father was really looking at the board with all his concentration. And then Mother handed him one of the twins. I think it was Tilly Tally. The baby started crying and Father had just too many things to think about. He went to wipe a little more icing off his king and ended up putting the king down on the wrong square. Silly Sally saw that she could take her castle and move it down to the last rank on the board, and that would be checkmate. She reached for the piece and was starting to yell checkmate when Gilly Galley grabbed it first and moved it to a different square. Silly Sally started to say something to Gilly Galley, but then caught a wink in his eye. She smiled and looked at Father. Even with a crying baby on his lap, Father could see that they'd left themselves open. He moved his, edge, his castle to the edge of the board and said, checkmate. Then the kids both yelled, 
Happy Father's Day at the same time. And they said it so loud that Tilly Tally stopped crying and looked at the board full of pieces. Father laughed and looked up at Mother. He realized he'd been played by all of them. That's when Tilly Tally picked up Father's King and stuck it in her mouth. She smiled as she tasted the chocolate icing on it. Father leaned back in his chair and reached for a fork to eat his cake. Well, I guess that was the worst game of chess I've ever played and maybe the most enjoyable game of chess I've ever played. Oh, and the king still has teeth marks on it today. The end. How cute. Thank you. All right, so, I have to see what time it is. We were planning to have no sermon today, just a bunch of baptisms. Talk about fun for you and for me. But we shifted gears. And uh, we were planning, even before the baptisms, to share a little bit about our financial status here at the church. It is June. It's about halfway through the year. Uh, we talked about finances in January at the annual meeting. We uh, approved a budget and that sort of thing. And since then, we thought, the leadership team thought that it would be good to kind of update us all so we're all on the same page of where the donations are. Um, during the last two years of COVID, many churches suffered financially. In fact, uh, some of them even closed. We actually did okay. Thank God and thank you. This year, our giving has been 8% under last year and 12% under our budget forecast. Now, we have a good amount of savings, but much of that is designated for certain things. It's not general reserves that we can call on if we need it. This year, we have not held back on ministry. Uh, you can sort of think back over the last two years of COVID, there wasn't a whole lot we could do. Uh, the men's breakfast that we used to have on Saturday was kind of hard because how can you eat with a mask on and a bunch of men are sitting around a table? We didn't think that was a good idea. So anyway, the first two years of COVID, we held back, but this year we did not. Think about the women's conference. Uh, we've done a lot of building renovation. We've done a lot of painting. And we want to do more than we did during COVID. We're thinking about the new children's director that we want to hire. Uh, we're doing VBS again this summer after not doing VBS for two years. Uh, and finally, we also got hit with some broken boilers. Most of you remember this. It was in the winter time, in the coldest part of winter. And uh, we had to do two things. One is we had to call some boiler fix-it people who were great, but they were swamped, as you can imagine, with COVID. Uh, everything takes longer and that sort of thing. So uh, when we called them, they couldn't come for a week or two. And so we hired a company to come in and blow hot air all around the building so that the pipes wouldn't freeze and break and kind of look like the front of our sanctuary, actually, all over the church. We didn't want that. So uh, we hired a company to blow hot air, and uh, that was a pretty expensive process. And then the boiler people came, and they fixed the boilers, and that was expensive for us as a church, but not too bad. Um, but the bottom line is it cost us about $20,000, that process. And uh, we are hoping that the insurance will cover it. We haven't submitted our claim yet, but we're going to probably this week. And uh, if they cover it, then we're all happy because we've already paid some of that already. Uh, we would just get our money reimbursed, I would assume. Uh, but some of it we haven't paid. So we didn't expect that, and it happened anyway. Uh, I will tell you that the food pantry is well-funded and doing great ministry. Uh, we'll always uh, take volunteer help if you haven't worked in the food pantry or haven't worked in the food pantry for a while. See John or Carol. The deacons are well-funded, and they are expanding ministry. You might see in the program uh, it, there's a, a note that says the next deacons meeting is open for people who need prayer. One of the things I loved about this church when I first got here is every so often, once or twice a month, uh, we would invite people to come up and just sit in the front row while the worship team played a song and the deacons and, and different ministers would pray for people who needed prayer. And uh, during COVID, of course, that wasn't happening. So the deacon said, you know, we can't go on like this forever, so we want people to come to our deacons meeting in person, and uh, we will lay hands on them if, the, if that's okay with them, and we will pray for them. So I'm excited. The deacons are not settling for COVID ministry. They're going back to real ministry. So if you want prayer, come to the deacons meeting. The information is in the bulletin. Um, our general giving for the general budget ministry needs some help. 
Um, now, this church has a long history of generosity, and I know that because I've gone through and uh, matched up attendance and offerings and stuff like that. When I first got here, I went back like 10 years. Um, we don't need a sermon today on giving. All I wanted to do was to let you know the financial status of where we're at and ask you to pray, especially for the insurance company, that we would find a favor with them. And that's it. If you have questions, you can come see me afterwards if you want. Okay, inside your bulletin, if you picked up a bulletin when you came in, are some sermon notes titled Arise and Shine. If you didn't, you still have time to run out and get a bulletin. Uh, if you are watching online, believe it or not, you can go to our website or our Facebook page and pick up the notes on this sermon. Uh, Kathy, our beloved and amazing secretary, uh, was able to get up this morning when we called her and said, help, help, we're not doing baptisms. And she said, no problem, I'll post these notes. And she posted them uh, extraordinarily quickly. All right, Arise and Shine comes from Isaiah 60, verse 1. The verse goes like this. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. I want to look at bits and pieces of that a little bit of the time. Start with Arise. And if you have your notes with you, you can fill in the blanks. I'll go slow so you can write in what, what needs to be written in. The world is ending. If you're taking notes, the world is ending. The time is short. We need to wake up and arise. Now, this verse from Isaiah was written thousands of years ago. But like much of the Old Testament, it is prophetic to uh, the time of Jesus and prophetic to where we are today. We are in the end times. And I'm not saying the world's ending this afternoon, but it is ending. We're a lot closer to the end than we were, what, 50 years ago, 100 years ago, 1,000 years ago? And even 2,000 years ago, Paul thought the world was ending then. So we are closer and closer to the ending. The time, we don't have as much time as we used to. So it's time to wake up. Romans 13, 11, 12 says, And do this, understanding the present time, the hour has come for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Okay, is Cherry here? Ah, oh, Cherry went downstairs. Did she uh, leave a basket with anyone? Okay, your beloved pastor uh, forgot something really important. If you look at a calendar, what is today? Father's Day. Father's Day. We're going to celebrate Father's Day by giving all the men in the congregation a gift. And Carol, um, do you remember that show where they said our lovely Carol Merrill is standing with the presents? So anyway, our lovely Carol is handing out presents to fathers and men and boys um, and we, I'm so sorry that I didn't let you guys know that earlier. I was supposed to do that just before I started my sermon, but I've been thinking about things. All right, so I hope you enjoy your gifts. Fathers, we are really blessed. Fathers are important. Okay. Arise, shine. Shine. Shining has a purpose. The Bible says that we are to arise and shine, and that shining has a purpose. From 1 Peter 2.9, says, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. We are shining to declare the glory of God. To declare the glory of God. We declare it with our words. We declare it with our lives. Filling in the blanks, we can shine brighter and brighter each day and each year. We shine brighter each day, each year. Proverbs 4.18, The path of the righteous is like the first gleam of dawn, shining ever brighter till the full light of day. You know, this is one of those analogies that the Bible has for um, the life of mankind in general that it started in creation, it continued and had the most important time of history in 0 or 32 AD, whenever it was, 
And eventually, our history comes to an end when Jesus comes back. And a whole new chapter starts. And I think this verse is like that. The path of the righteous is like the first gleam of dawn, shining ever brighter. Let's say that. Can you say ever brighter? Ever brighter. I said it. Let's try it again. Ever brighter. Until the full light of day. I, to me, the full light of day happens when Jesus comes back and we spend eternity with God. But until that day comes, we're not told that we're going to get ever dimmer. It says we're going to get ever brighter. So let's think about that. For your light has come. Jesus is the light. We know that. Jesus is the light. From John, it says, when Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. I am the light of the world. That's what Jesus says. Filling in the blank again, God put the light of Christ in our hearts. 2 Corinthians 4, 6, For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, that was during creation, by the way, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. Isn't that something? To give us the light of the knowledge of the glory. Sometimes the Bible does this. Blank, but up, but up, but up. You have to look at each one. The knowledge, the knowledge means we're going to, something's going to be revealed to us that we will understand. The knowledge of the glory of God. The glory of God is, is all the wonderfulness of God, the supernatural of God, the, the things that God does that are extraordinary, His grace and His love and His mercy. The glory of God, where is it? In the face of Christ. You know, there's a wonderful verse that says, uh, Christ is the uh, vision or the, the picture of the invisible God, the image of the invisible God, that he is the face of God that we get to see, or they got to see 2,000 years ago, that he is all the glory of God in physical form. That's Jesus. And so we see the glory of God in the face of Christ. Okay. With Jesus in our hearts, we shine. Now, Everything up to now you've probably heard a thousand times, but think about this. With Jesus in our hearts, we shine. Because God put the glory of Jesus in our hearts so that it will shine out the face of Christ, the glory of God. But we also shine because Christ is in us. We reflect his glory. We uh, show his glory to others. In Matthew 5, Jesus, again, he says, you are the light of the world. Isn't that funny? He said, I am the light of the world. And then he says, you are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Almost every Sunday when I pray for the churches of central New York, I say, let us all shine like lights on a hill. Because that's, that's how I picture it. Jesus shines through us, not just through Redeemer Covenant, but through the church down the street and up the street and over the streets. And we all shine because we have Jesus in our hearts. We shine. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men, that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Now, how many good deeds do you have to do to go to heaven? You can just yell it out. I know. Zero. Good. Because good deeds don't get us into heaven. Um, how many good deeds do we have to do to make God happy with us? Mm, zero. Doesn't matter. God decided to be happy with us, to shed his grace on us, to put his mercy on us, because we deserved none of it. So what we're talking about here, that people would see our good deeds, it's not that we're doing good deeds because we're trying to perform for God. It's that it's when people see what we do or how we live our lives— and we say, well, it's Jesus in my heart. It's because I'm a Christian that I do that. I live my life, since you're asking, because I want to please my Father. I want to look like Jesus. I want to live my life the way he lived his life. And then people say, oh, wow, if you're reflecting Jesus, you're living like Jesus, maybe I should look into this Jesus, because I really like what I see in you. Okay? Let me read that again. In the same way, let your light shine before men 
that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Last part of the verse. And the glory of the Lord rises upon you. We reflect the glory of God. The glory of Christ, sorry. You can put Christ in the blank if you want to. 2 Corinthians 3.18 And we, who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory, are being transformed into his likeness with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Father, who is the Spirit. Now, this is a tricky verse, because if you don't know the story that Paul is referring to, then this won't make so much sense to you. And we're going to read the story in just a second, but I want to read the verse again. It says, We who with unveiled faces reflect the Lord's glory. We're being transformed into his likeness. We say that over and over again. I, I want to grow as a Christian so that my life looks more and more like Jesus' life. So the decisions I make look more and more like what Jesus decided. The sacrifice he made going to the cross, I want to emulate that with some maybe smaller sacrifices. A better tip for the waitress at the restaurant. Uh, more love toward my wife and children, parents, those around me. I want to look more and more like Christ. We're being transformed into his likeness with ever-increasing glory. Ever-increasing glory. Now, Christ is in our hearts, but the verse says we reflect the Lord's glory. And then we're, we're growing like him with ever-increasing glory. So where do the, does the ever-increasing glory come from? It's not like we're becoming better people so we have more glory inside of us and it's going to everly increase. Mm, the verse in the beginning says that we reflect Jesus' glory. So here's the thing. If I want to reflect something, let's say a simple mirror, I'm going to I want to see how I look. I want to make sure my, you know, shirt's on straight, my hair is down, whatever. Um, if the mirror was in the back of the sanctuary, I wouldn't have such a good view, and I wouldn't be able to see the reflection very well. So what might I do? Kind of walk toward it? And the closer I got to the mirror, the better would be my view of what I was trying to see. In the same way, the closer we are to Christ, the better reflection we will be of his glory. So you say, well, Bill, how am I supposed to put this verse, verse 18, into practice? What more do I have to do? I'm already coming to church. I'm already doing this. I'm already doing that. Well, all that's good, but I'll tell you what, if you, if you had to concentrate on one thing to fulfill this verse, I would say get closer and closer to Christ. Get closer and closer to Christ. Spend more time with him. And it can be time with no agenda. If you get up every morning and have a quiet time, or before you go to bed, or through the day, whatever, that's wonderful. And hopefully during that time, you might read a few Bible verses, you might pray for those things that are important to your heart. But try to schedule in, if you can, some just alone time with God. Get close to the mirror, as close you could get, so that we reflect his glory. All right. Now, we're going to read that story that Paul was referring to in 2 Corinthians, I think, about the uh, veiled faces. We're going to start with the guy who had veiled face in Exodus 34. If you're filling in the blank, put in, Moses had a fading glory. It says, when Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the testimony in his hands, now, what this means, he went up, remember the story, he went up on the mountain, got, he was there for like 40 days, a long time. God gave him two big rocks with the Ten Commandments on it and said, okay, go show the Israelites. And, you know, they were on their way from Egypt into the Promised Land. And, and uh, while he was on the mountain, the people kind of went crazy and built a golden calf and started worshiping badly. It was, it was a bad scene. Anyway, so when Moses came down from the mountain after having spent time with God, it says, uh, he was not aware that his face was radiant because he had spoken with the Lord. Now, what does that look like? I have no idea. Was it like a suntan on steroids? I don't know, but maybe he glowed somehow. There was a glory that was on his face. 
When Aaron and all the Israelites saw Moses, his face was radiant, and they were afraid to come near him. But Moses called to them. So Aaron and all the leaders of the community came back to him, and he spoke to them. Afterward, all the Israelites came near him, and he gave them all the commands of the Lord that the Lord had given him on Mount Sinai. When Moses finished speaking to them, he put a veil over his face. But whenever he entered the Lord's presence to speak with him, he removed the veil until he came out. And when he came out and told the Israelites what he had been commanded, they saw his face was radiant. Then Moses would put the veil back over his face. Now, what does that have to do with what Paul wrote? Back in in 2 Corinthians 3.18, it says, We who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory. Um, We're going to move ahead now to 2 Corinthians 3, 7 through 12. I'm sorry, if you're filling in the blanks, we have an increase in glory. Moses had a fading glory. We have an ever-increasing glory. 2 Corinthians 3. Now, if the ministry that brought death, which was engraved in letters on stone, came with glory, so that the Israelites could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of its glory, fading though it was, will not the ministry of the Spirit be even more glorious? Fading as it was, there is a, um, well, there's hints in Scripture, but uh, it's, it's a Jewish, I don't know what you call it, oral tradition, whatever, that this, this glory that was on Moses' face eventually began to fade, kind of like a suntan. You get a beautiful suntan on day one, and then on day two it's a little faded, day three it's a little faded. And the story is that's what happened, and that's what Paul's referring to here. And he's saying those the, the ministry that brought death, which was the Ten Commandments. Why does he call it the ministry that brought death? Because the purpose of the Ten Commandments of all the commands of the Old Testament was to show us that we are not God. We are not perfect. We are not holy. And we need God. It, it showed us our death, that we needed Christ for resurrection. If the ministry that condemns men is glorious, did I skip a verse? No. Will not the ministry of the Spirit be even more glorious? If the ministry that condemns men is glorious, how much more glorious is the ministry that brings righteousness? For what was glorious has no glory now in comparison with the surpassing glory. In other words, the glory that was on Moses' face, that's like nothing compared to the glory that's in us. Verse 11, And if what was fading away came with glory... How much greater is the glory of that which lasts? Ever increasing glory for us. And the the story in the extra biblical sense is that as Moses' glory on his face was fading, then he wore the veil so they wouldn't see that it was fading. Originally he put on the veil because it was too much for them. They were scared to death about it. But as it started to fade, he kept the veil so they wouldn't see that it was fading. Don't know if that's true or not. That's what I heard. For us, we don't have to have a veil on our face because our glory is not fading. In fact, our glory is ever increasing. Why? Because we're growing in Christ. We are spending time with him. Christ on the inside is coming out to the outside more and more. We have ever increasing glory. Therefore, since we have such a hope, we are very bold. We are very bold. Why? Because the glory of God shines on us and through us. People should see the glory of God's Spirit shining in our lives, starting on the inside with transformed character. If you're filling in the blank, transformed character. That is the greatest witness. What about someone who stands on the street corner and preaches with a really loud voice? Isn't that a great witness? Eh, It might be. I I wouldn't condemn that. That might work. Um, But most people that I've known get excited about God when they see the character change in us. That's usually the first place that someone will see a Christian's change is in his character. Galatians 5.22, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. You know, that is not a description of the world or even our country in 2022. 
you can look at each one of those and say, oh boy, hate is getting a, a lot more play today than love is. Number two, then in our thinking with a transformed mind, this is how God sees, or people see the glory of God's Spirit shining in our lives, first in our character, but then in our mind. Philippians 4, 8, finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Our country is um, just, what's the word? It's like they can't think about love or joy or peace or Jesus or God because they're, they're all the time thinking, they're, they're all the time thinking about hate or equality where they don't think there is some or getting offended where they were or were not offended, I don't know. And it's like they're so predisposed to think that way that they're missing everything God has for them. So we are told as Christians not to dwell on those things, not to get sidetracked into standing up for our rights or whatever. I'm not saying all that's bad, but as Christians, we have a higher calling, and that calling is to think about what is noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable, excellent, praiseworthy. And then finally, people should see the glory of God's Spirit shining in our lives in a transformed life, in a transformed life. 2 Timothy 3.10, Paul is writing to Timothy, and uh, Timothy is a young pastor. It's the second letter Paul's written to him. Paul's like his mentor, and he, he says to Timothy, you, however, know all about my teaching. You know what? We know all about Paul's teaching too, don't we? It's most of the New Testament, Paul's teaching. We know all about it, but he also says, my way of life. We have hints about his way of life, but we weren't there. My purpose, again, we see some of Paul's purpose come through in his writing, but not all of it. His faith, maybe, patience, love, endurance, persecutions, sufferings. Now, when Paul is mentoring his young pastor friend, Timothy, he's already given him a bunch of theology. And in 1 Timothy 1, he helps them get through church problems and what to do as a church pastor. But here might be one of the last letters that Paul wrote. He finally says, you know, you know who I am because you saw not just my teaching, but my way of life, my purpose, my faith, patience, love, endurance, the persecutions and sufferings. As if Paul was to say, listen, Timothy, if you want to be a great preacher, if you want to emulate me, if you want to mimic what I've done in ministry, and Paul did a lot in ministry, he said, yeah, you got the teachings, but try to emulate the life that I live. And what's going to happen with us is as we become transformed by the face of Christ, the glory of God, people will see our lives also transformed. And that shines like a light on a hill. Hey, I'm going to pray for y'all. Um, why don't we stand up, if you can? Now, as sometimes happen when funny, funny, unexpected things happen, we have a beautiful, huge cake that has baptism and the name of the four people getting baptized. And since it probably won't last three weeks, we're going to eat it right now. Um, and then as we eat it, you can be thinking about those four people that will probably get baptized on July 10th, and uh, we won't just like run them across the wet floor. We will actually dunk them in the tub up here. Um, so I would invite you to the fellowship hall. We have plates and forks and a big old cake. Heavenly Father, thank you, thank you, thank you. Lord, we don't always understand why things happen, but no matter what happens, we trust that we and everything around us is in the palm of your hand. So, Father, we give you glory. We give you glory as Paul did in persecutions and sufferings. We give you glory in teachings and in life. We give you glory, hopefully, in everything that we say and do and think. In Jesus' name, amen. To the fellowship hall. We also have Panera Bread, by the way.